we ended the last exam, we'll talk about the exam if we get through things quickly enough, by looking at how muscles contract. The story that we had going for us was we would have an action potential going down a motor neuron. When it reached the end of the motor neuron, we are going to release a neurotransmitter. For our purposes, it's always going to be acetylcholine, ACH. ACH is going to bind to a receptor on the postsynaptic or the muscle cell membrane. What that's going to trigger is a depolarization. So we'll go from a negative charge inside the cell to a positive charge inside the cell. That is going to spread from the contact point. It'll then move on down through some things called T-tubules, where they will end up causing the release of calcium ions. Calcium ions are going to diffuse all into the cell. They're going to bind to components of the thin filament. In particular, it's going to be troponin. That's going to allow for tropomyosin to move out of the way. We just called it the thin filaments. The result is actin is going to be allowed to cross bridge with myosin. The moment they cross bridge, they're going to cause a power stroke. And that power stroke is going to be the muscle contraction. So they'll touch. So whenever you get actin plus myosin, we're going to get a power stroke. In order to reset this, we add ATP. And that will allow us to continue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Sorry, Mr. Ant. Actually, you're a Miss Ant. You're dead. And we'll repeat this over and over and over again until we stop the... Action potentials. So it'll stop when we stop the action potentials or we run out of ATP. So sad, too bad. Your lab this week is going to be playing with this. It turns out that your control over your muscles depends on the nerves or the neurons and how many muscle cells each neuron touches. So there's a ratio that exists. So we look at the ratio of neurons to muscle cells. We refer to that ratio as a motor unit. So motor unit would be motor neuron to muscle cells. We would say that a sm you have small motor units because the ratio is really small, meaning you're getting closer to one to one. A larger motor unit would be one to a thousand. You know about these, even though you've never known about these. Motor units tell you about fine control. And you have known about this because you have had the joy of once writing with your hand and then you had the brilliant thought of, I'm going to write with my feet. And then you try. And it takes you five minutes to hold the pencil or the pen between your toes. But you keep trying anyway because you're like, no, I could do this. I could totally do this. And the answer is no, you can't. Because the motor units that control the movement of your toes are larger than the motor units that control your fingers. It's why you can have a lot of dexterity with your fingers, yet you don't with your toes. We have fine motion control over what's going on with your upper arms, but when it comes to your lower limbs, you don't. We even saw this in a picture. The picture that showed you this was the homunculus 
of the motor cortex. That weird picture from the side where you saw all those body parts. What you were actually looking at were the motor can or the motor units. The other thing that's useful for you actually having decent control is also having control of muscles as pairs. All muscles work in pairs. We call these pairs antagonists. Meaning, if I have one muscle that's going to pull, if I have one muscle that will pull, I need to have one muscle that will push. They need to go in opposites. It explains if you've ever seen guys who go to the gym and they only exercise one set of muscles and they seem to be like stuck in certain positions and you're like, what's your problem? They're like, I can't move my arms the other way. And it's because they're only training one side of the muscles and they are completely ignoring the antagonist. So if you wanted to flex your elbow, so, words that we don't remember. So, flexing an elbow would be taking the angle of the joint and you make it smaller. So, flexing the elbow is what you would call flexing your biceps. But, physiologically speaking, that makes zero sense. You can't flex your biceps. Unless you rip the bicep off of your body and then bend it. Which would be painful. So, if you were to flex your elbow, that would be one of the muscles, or one of the muscles that would do that would be your biceps. The catch is muscles only know how to contract. So if you then stopped, it would remain stuck like this. So how do you unflex the elbow? We need to have another muscle that can grab on, and when it contracts, pull it back. What's that muscle? Do you know that name? Yes. The triceps, in particular the triceps brachii, they work in opposites of each other. If you only exercise your triceps, the result is, hey, can you pick your nose? And the answer is, you can't. You only work your biceps and you say, hey, high five. They're like, I can't. It's because... If your antagonists are in such a case where one is stronger than the other, then the other can't undo the contraction of the first. And you're kind of stupid looking. The better control you have over your antagonists, the better control you have over your muscles. For your fingers, you have about half a dozen muscles in your forearm. You have the equal number on the other side of your forearm. And their job is to control where your fingers are. If you're looking at these muscles and you're trying to watch them electrically, and this is what we're going to try and see, you all get to pick someone in your lab group to be the test dummy. It'll be highly entertaining because you're going to freak their muscles out this week. Usually, if you look at the table and you say, who's not here, you have your answer as to who you're testing. <laughs> Although, she's really sick, so <laughs> that's a different story. It's more this table. I, I totally know who this table's oh, picking. Yeah. <laughs> and you all, good luck. He may or may not be, I don't know. <laughs> so, what we can do is we can actually keep track here on the horizontal axis of time. What we're going to do here is we can say, cause the contraction. And on the vertical axis, we'll actually measure the tension, meaning the contraction. If I look at an action potential, so for action potentials, here's what it would look like over time. I would see... Beep, 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 
50, or I can get them like all in a row. But there's something in common with this picture that you can't see. All of them are the exact same size. Action potentials are just action potentials. There's no big ones, there's no small ones. There's just action potentials. Muscles don't behave this way. Muscles can build on themselves, meaning I can contract once and then I contract again before I have a chance to undo the contraction. So muscle contractions are capable of being added up. Fancy word for when you add them up is called summation. What does that mean? You can make muscle contractions stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And you can observe this if you were to make a graph of it. What we'll see is you can have one twitch, meaning it contract once. You can contract twice in a row. If you do that, it actually increases the strength. But if you keep contracting more and more and more and more, the strength will keep building until it reaches a maximum, meaning I can't contract anymore. Everything that I can throw in is what I'm giving you. When you reach that maximum point, we call that tetanus. Wait, like the disease? Yes, like the word, the disease. What does the disease tetanus do? It causes your muscles to go to maximum contraction and it locks them in place and you can't let go, which is why it kills you. Because when that happens to your lungs and your diaphragm, you're done for. You can't undo the muscle contraction. So tetanus is from rusty nails, right? The answer is no. The rusty nail has nothing to do with it. It's the hole you put into your body. And rusty nails are probably in a dirty area. Dirty and dusty areas have the bacterium that causes tetanus. The rusty nail has nothing to do with any of it. Where would you find it? Anywhere outside that's exposed to the elements. You can get tetanus just by playing on a baseball field. Just breathe in the dust that's being kicked up. You can get it just fine. Nothing to do with you getting stabbed. It's just, it's a bacterium that only lives where it's hidden from oxygen. So that's why you need to have a deep stab wound. Because the inside of your body doesn't have oxygen floating around. So that's fun. You can witness this. You're going to witness it in part on Thursday. So there's two ways we can do this. I can do this through electrical stimulation, which would be expensive, but entertaining. Why? Because all we would do is we would get the period cramp simulator, and all the guys would be tested on it. Because ladies, you've already had your test all the time. So what's the point of you having to go through it again? So all the guys in the room would be part of the simulation where we can actually watch the muscle or the electrical stimulation and you can observe how they react. And the answer is they'll start crying before we turn the machine on. Why? Because I'm pretty sure I would start crying before we turn the machine on and I cut a hole in my head. So, just saying. The other way we can do this is I can make you lift weights until you start to fuse in place. And literally, it's like, I can't, like, my arm is stuck. Like, I'm, I can't do anything else. So we're going to do that way because we don't need to deal with the guys crying. Being on, I know it'd be fun, but I know. You, oh, you can get them for like 50 bucks. And you want Amazon? We've already ruined the environment, so you know, we could do one day shipping. Yeah. Anyway, all muscles are not the same, 
People talk about dark wheat, the dark meat and white meat. There is a difference. You can observe the difference, but they actually do have physiological differences between them. Dark meat is dark because of mitochondria. And mitochondria have like a tan color to it. And they're tan colored because mitochondria have iron. And diffuse amounts of iron look like a tannish color, like the gray matter of a brain or a spinal cord. Same thing. So if you had dark meat, it has more mitochondria. If you have white meat, it has less mitochondria. What does that tell you? More mitochondria tell you that you are capable of doing aerobic respiration. You can make lots of ATP. Well, what type of exercise requires lots of ATP? Weightlifting or running for 100 miles? Deadlifting a car or running to Washington, D.C. and back? Which one requires more energy? The running does. So, in less than a month, it's Thanksgiving. Where's the dark meat on the turkey? Have, or have you never paid attention because you're like, yeah, I don't like turkey. Or you don't like dark meat. Breast tissue is not. It's white meat. So thighs and legs, where else? The wings actually would be too. If you don't know if it's dark meat or white meat, think of which ones are oily and which ones are not oily. Which, which part of the turkey or chicken, you can think of chicken too, do you think of as getting dry really fast? Which parts tend not to dry out really fast? If you can think of that, you can now separate white meat from dark meat. All of the dark meat tends to be oilier. And if you were to then put that onto your body, what you'd see is you can kind of use them for a long time. They don't tire out as quickly as other things would. Fast twitch muscles are good for short-term use. You would call fast twitch muscles white meat. You can do your 10 push ups and say, you know what, I think I'm good for the day. Slow twitch muscles, you would call your dark meat. And they're good for endurance. So here's a good one that you've never noticed. You can sit there and say, I'm tired of standing. Is it tired of standing or is it your feet hurt? Your feet hurt. Your legs aren't ready to buckle on you. It's your feet hurt. That's your shoes suck. Because we insist on wearing shoes in this country. What would be better? No shoes. Like flat out, just no shoes. The catch is, depending on where you are in this country, no shoes equals you get a parasite. So, shoes. And a lot of the world, how could we stop a lot of people from having parasites? Give them shoes. The problem is wearing shoes ruins your feet. So, uh, details. But you've never had it where your, where your legs actually were genuinely exhausted from standing. It's always your feet that give out. When was the last time, like, literally, my back and my, my abs, I can't handle sitting upright. <laughs> they are so exhausted from sitting. It has never happened. What type of muscle do you have there? You have the slow twitch. It's the stuff that's good to keep on going as long as you need it to keep on going. We can divide it up into different terms. So we have like fast twitch that's glycolytic and fast twitch that's oxidative. 
and then slow twitch is always going to be oxidative. It's worth noting that when you look at these, that the oxidative tends to be darker, the glycolytic tends to be the white meat, it's faster. You can't actually necessarily say that one muscle is this type. All muscles are all types. The difference is which one predominates. So there's always going to be one in the majority. That's it. Hormones. An easy, easy topic. Hormones in animals is very different than hormones in plants. It is a much different monster. Plants, it's weird just because you've never heard of any of those words before. And there are big classes of hormones. So it's not oxen, it's auxins. It's not gibberellin, it's gibberellins. Animals we have very distinct groups of hormones. And with those distinct groups of hormones comes regulation of every single one of them. Your exams. So from exam two, we still have a few who still need to take it, but we'll worry about that. From the multiple choice, the average was 79%. That's really good. So am I going to give you all points back? That's really high. Like, why would I do that? Now, if the average were 29%, yes, absolutely, I'd have to be giving you all points back. This isn't OCHEM. <laughs> I don't take pride in, like, oh, look at you all. You're so smart. You broke. You got into the second digits for an exam average. Like, no, 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 no. That's pretty good. And the free response is probably going to braise it up even more. For the lab exam, I'm halfway done with them. Some of you, I think, have a perfect score so far. Some of you don't. Yes, that's how I'll say it. And some of you don't. Like, don't, don't. Like, it's a, did you read the question? Because your answer and this question do not match each other at all. One that a lot of you have done, and by a lot I mean eh, about a third of you, is you like to reference like, oh yes, I'm going to do a t-test or I'll use an ANOVA while describing your experiment as being done over time. Things that are done over time are correlations and regressions. The moment you said over time, you automatically shifted what your statistics have to be. But I did. I had to measure it over the course of a week and don't bring up the over the week part as what you're doing because you're changing what you want to talk about in terms of statistics. Cell signaling. Oh, cell signaling. Trick or treat. Thank you. <laughs> Please, my belly sticks out. I don't need that. I know you're like, I'm so glad I showed up today. What? My back is to you. I don't know what you're doing. As long as there's no, mm -hmm. no evidence. Yes, there's a Reese's. It's right in front of you. Oh. 
I know, now you all are like, I'm so glad I showed up. I got candy. Cell signaling as a refresher, because I know that this is one of those things that doesn't rank or keep in anyone's head. Step number one, signal has to bind to some type of receiver. So we have to have reception. So this is always going to be the hormone plus the receptor. We're going to have some type of transduction. So this is going to be where we're moving the signal. And you're going to move it from the receptor to whatever the response is. The response is always going to show up in one of two ways. We are either going to turn genes on and off, or we're going to make things start to move inside the cell. Meaning I might start spitting out some bubbles. Or I, start, I might start moving some proteins around so they get turned on. But something's going to start to move. With us animals, we use a mixture of proteins and steroid type signals. The most famous of the protein signals that you've probably heard of. I heard it. Insulin. The first transgenic gene ever used was insulin. Do you know where we used to get insulin before we engineered it and put it inside a bacteria? Well, it's from the pancreas, so we need to get it from an animal. Uh, we used to blame it on pigs, but it's not where the most or the majority of people would get it. I, I For some odd reason, I had to look it up. And I was like, oh, well, I would have gotten that wrong because I would have said pig too. We need something that is in abundant supply. Cows, yes. Because after all, let's make some money from them. The catch is, it was still expensive because you had to grind up the pancreases, extract only the insulin out, and then it's not going to stay that long because... We don't happen to have deep freeze all over the place. So it was still very much a, if you're not rich, you're not getting it. So it was only the rich who would be able to afford it. And oh, I think it's still that way. So go figure. Most famous of the steroids? Pardon? Testosterone is one of the famous ones. One more time. Pregnizone, definitely. Own, own. There's another really famous one. It doesn't end with own, though. Here, I'll help you. It starts with E. Estrogen. All those are steroids. Where do they come from? Cholesterol. Is cholesterol bad? Too much of anything is bad. Too much water is drowning. I was going to make a Matthew Perry reference, but I think it's still maybe too soon. I don't know. Is it not strange how people are always... I'm so sad about this one person who you have never met in your entire life. So many people around the world are dying, but some things are just, oh, you can't, but then you brush away all sorts of other death and suffering. Just saying. When we look at those hormones, they're going to have one of two spots where they're going to target. If you turn out to have any type of protein receptor, so a protein, or sorry, not a protein receptor, but a protein hormone, 
you will always be able to find it because it will have its receptor on the cell surface. You'll always have a receptor on the cell surface. They are usually famous, as I pointed out once upon a time, for a cytoplasmic response. The cell is going to change what it's doing. So here on the left, it's not really telling us how. Here on the right, it's telling us about this weird thing called a GPCR, a G-protein coupled receptor, and this thing called a G-protein and a adenylyl cyclase and a cyclic AMP and stuff. This would be the cell changing its behavior and saying, let's not make more glycogen, but let's instead break it down. So let's try and make more energy. Well, why would that happen? Well, the hormone's called epinephrine. And if you know anything about epinephrine, it makes sense. What's the other name for epinephrine? This is the American word, epinephrine. Most of you know it by its European name. I'll help you. It starts with an A. Yes, adrenaline. Adrenaline is the British word. Epinephrine is the American word. Odd how you know the British word, but you don't know the American word. Hmm. <laughs> Steroid hormones. behave by a different game, their receptors are within the cell. Bless you. They're going to have cellular receptors. They will typically target the nucleus, and they're going to function as things that we call transcription factors. The transcription factors are going to be proteins that help or hinder gene expression. Oh, you've heard that one before. Estradiol. You know it as estrogen. When animals talk to, or animal cells talk to other animal cells, they are going to do it in a few different ways. One way is what we call endocrine. This is when you put the signal into a tube. When we say tube, what we mean to say is a blood vessel. This is in contrast with an exocrine signal, these go on to surfaces. You would find these in your digestive tract. My digestive tract is a circle. Correct. So how is that different than endocrine? Ah, we have to remember back to how animals are built. Animals, if you look at them in their most horrifyingly simple way, are a hot dog bun. Or we just kind of make the middle into a tube. Here would be the outside of your body. So here's your skin. In the middle would be bones and muscles, and blood, and organs, and stuff. So what's in the middle? Your digestive tract. And if you're to look at it, it's a smooth line from the outside of your body into your digestive tract and right on out.
food has never gone inside of your body. Because if it did, you would get an infection and probably die from the infection. Food always stays outside of your body. Because your digestive tract is outside of your body. It just turns out to be in a tube that runs through the middle of you. But it's outside of your body. So anything that's dumped into here, we call it exocrine. Because exo is the outside. Well, this is technically outside of your body. It just happens to have a clamp on the one end and a clamp on the other end. But it's still outside of your body. And the moment you realize that, it makes looking at people really weird. Just saying. Paracrine is a cell talking to the cell next to it. This is going to be your immune system. It likes to talk to its neighbors. Autocrine is when you talk to yourself. We're going to see this also a lot with your immune system. What makes these hormones strange is where they come from. Hormones can come from glands. Bless you. But there's also a subset where hormones can come from neurons. We call those ones neurohormones. So then what's the difference between a neurotransmitter and a neurohormone? What it does is the only difference. Neurotransmitter just talks to the cell next door. It's paracrine. A neurohormone or a neuropeptide is going to spit its protein into the blood supply, and it's going to then go forth and do its hormone thing. Why point that out? Because we have to keep track of which ones we're talking about. Because it changes how you control them. I don't like this anymore. Mind you, we have yet to talk about hormones. We're just talking about like grouping them. The way that we control hormones is with more hormones. Yes, that sigh is the correct sound. You have hormones that are called releasing hormones. So these are hormones that cause other hormones to get released. Wait, seriously? Yes. So we have hormones that say, release the hormones. On its opposite end, we have hormones that stop the release of hormones. And we call those inhibiting hormones. Who thought of this system? Take it up with God. So we have some hormones that have a releasing hormone and an inhibitory hormone. We have some that only come with the releasing hormone, but they don't have an inhibitory hormone. So it becomes, wait, what? Why, why is this? We also have other cases where it's just another hormone that fights back against the other hormone. We just have hormones being antagonists. We also have hormones that are called tropic hormones. Tropic. Not tropic, but tropic. Because tropism makes reference to a nourishment, like a trophic level. And trophic hormones cause its target to become active. It actually swells up like it's being fed. 
And if you were to remove that trophic stimulation, it shrivels it up. So one of the hormones that was dropped was pregnisone. Why would you have pregnisone? Because you're having a bad immune response. We need to say, stop it. So we add steroids to fight back. Got it. It's feeling wet. Although, according to this group, I'm probably going to kill myself with this water. But Details. If the water kills me, you don't have to turn into the rough track. I like, oh, how do I feel about this now? I don't know. If you take too much pregnisone, what it tells your body is, I'm making enough hormones. Because pregnisone is mimicking hormones that you already have. So your body becomes convinced, I'm doing a great job. So what it's going to do is stop releasing a tropic hormone that targets your adrenal cortex, which is where it would be made. What that does is it makes your adrenal cortex shrink. To the point where if you then said, you know what, I don't need this pregnisone anymore, and you stopped, you die. Why do you die? Because you have no more adrenal cortex. Because you have been giving it a signal saying it is nourished. There's no point in making it swell up even more, even though it's coming from an outside source. There's a similar one that can be done. Oh, it's not bleeding that bad. Approved. It's, it's a non-zero sum. It feels like there's a dent right there, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like, oh, we'll feel that, right? That's kind of nice. Another example, using one of the other hormones that we dealt with, would be testosterone. So if you were someone who had to, for whatever reason, and there's actually legitimate reasons to have to take lots of testosterone, what it tells your body is, oh, you're, making, you're doing a great job making all that testosterone. Good job, sweetie. So what that's going to do is tell your brain, you did a great job at making all that testosterone. We don't need to make so much. So what it's going to do is tell the tropic hormones that cause the source of the testosterone to exist, I don't need to be here. So the tropic hormones that would usually lead to the production of testosterone stops. But that doesn't matter because you're injecting the testosterone into yourself. But your body doesn't know that it's not coming from you. And the result is the source of said testosterone shrivels smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until effectively not even present. Which I suppose for some groups of people is not good. And if you don't know where testosterone comes from, we'll get there. And if you do know where testosterone comes from, hooray. That's one way that we can, or that both of those examples, the pregnisone and the testosterone example, follow what we call feedback loops. In particular, that would be a negative feedback loop. So negative feedback loops is when the production of something stops its own release. So here this one's using an example using a uh, secretin, which is actually this one here. So you release secretin. going to be found inside of your digestive tract. The result is it's going to go to its intended source, but it's also going to go to a receiver, to a, like a monitor. And the monitor is going to say, you have enough. And what that's going to do is feed back I'm going to use a fancy symbol with a line. 
That means stop. We're convinced you made enough. Stop doing it. We can also witness this with two hormones fighting each other. So this is just an on-off switch. We could also do this with hormones. So a famous example of this would be you have low extracellular fluid glucose. If you have low extracellular glucose, what you need to do is jack it up. So how would you do that? Do any of you know the hormone? It's one that almost never goes wrong, so most people don't know it, but it's called glucagon. What glucagon's gonna do is jack up your blood glucose. Then it's gonna be high. If you have high glucose, what are you gonna do? You say, oh crap, it's too high, I need to drop it down. So what's that hormone? Insulin. And it's gonna drive it down. Also, coincidentally, glucagon is going to tell insulin to knock off, or to knock it off, and insulin tells glucagon also to knock it off. So the two fight each other. Easy enough. But that's negative feedback. That's where you're fighting against whatever you're changing. A positive feedback loop we don't have too many of these because positive feedback loops are kind of like bad, bad situations. We're going to cause more of itself. So one of these could be oxytocin. I don't know if you know anything about oxytocin. One more time. So it's famous use, we have a synthetic version of it, it's in labor. So what oxytocin does is it causes uterine contractions. For those of you who want to know what it would feel like to give birth, well, if you also have the ability to know what menstrual cramps are, you have a preview of what it would be like. Because it's the same organ cramping. So what do you do? Oxytocin, when it's initially released, it causes the, the uterus, which is basically a vase of muscle, to go squeeze. And when it does that, what it's trying to do is push a a eh, five to ten pound bowling ball out a hole. So when it does that squeeze, it's going to push it out just a little bit. The catch is, and it's one of the things that we don't talk about, is with muscle. The more you stretch muscle out, the the it weakens. So if you let it get shorter, it gets stronger. So the muscle can so this thing contracts and it pushes out this kid. Just a little bit, which lets it shrink a little bit. That sends a signal to the brain that says, oh, I'm doing a good job. Let's do it again. And it's going to surge out more oxytocin, which is then going to cause the uterus to cramp even harder, which will push the baby out even more, which will make it so it shrinks a little bit more. So the next time we get a contraction, it's going to be even stronger, but that compression sends a signal to the brain, which then says, oh, I'm really good at this, and it's going to send out even more oxytocin, which will cause an even harder contraction, which will then push the baby out even more, which will make the, the bag even smaller, so it can even contract harder the next time. We're going to keep doing this over and over 
and over, where we're going to keep surging that oxytocin more and more and more, with those contractions getting stronger and stronger and stronger until the evil has passed. What is the evil? You have a parasite that's been growing in your body for nine months. <laughs> and you now need to pass it out of a hole that is going to be 10 centimeters in diameter. So what are your endocrine glands? The answer is every time we look, we get a new set of endocrine glands. So we have very famous ones. So we have glands that are known as being purely endocrine. And then we can have some glands that get to mix and match. And they sometimes do one thing and sometimes they're endocrine and sometimes they make enzymes and stuff. So the super famous ones would be things like the pineal gland. So that's the one that makes melatonin. That's the sleepy time one. The hypothalamus does actually secrete some hormones. It's actually a, it secretes neuropeptides. The pituitary gland is probably the most famous of all the glands. Usually people call it the master gland, but it's not because it has a puppet master. You have a thyroid. Your thyroid gland is found right here on your neck. You're going to take that thing and rip it off and look at it from behind. It has four little buttons on it, and those four little buttons are additional glands that are not the same as your thyroid gland. We call those parathyroid glands. We have the adrenal glands. We call them the adrenal glands because of how they form. Ad means towards. Renal is kidneys. These are tissues that start somewhere else, and they migrate to the kidneys, which is why we call them adrenal, towards the kidneys. We, of course, name them also, or we give their most famous hormone that they create, named after the gland, which is adrenaline, which is why we call it adrenaline. So why would we call something epinephrine? Because we can also call the adrenal glands the epinephrotic glands. Why would we do that? Because it's telling you instead of how they form, we're telling you where they are. Epi is on top of, nephrotic is your kidneys. So I can either reference to the fact that they start somewhere else and they move, or they're just stacked on top. Either case, the name actually works. Your pancreas turns out to do a bunch of stuff. Here we're labeling ovaries and testes, but we're ignoring the stomach. We're ignoring the skin. We're ignoring intestines. There is plenty of evidence that body fat is a an endocrine gland as well. So there's lots of places that make hormones in your body. So if you were ever told, oh, you're going to memorize all the glands, the answer is, well, good luck, because we keep adding to the list. Let's deal with the fun set first, the hypothalamus. So your hypothalamus is part of your diencephalon. So that was that middle part of your, that second part of your brain. It's also known as a relay center. So... It gets lots of sensations going into there. Some of those sensations include things like osmolarity, so it knows if it's watery, if you have too much water, if you don't have enough water. It's been telling all of us that, by the way, you're not drinking enough water. Why? Because it's been hot and windy outside and we're all dehydrated. And how can you figure that out by looking at people? You look at their lips. Their lips are... Cracked or crusty, congratulations, you're not drinking enough water, and suddenly you become very self-aware of how your lips are looking. It is the giveaway, the first and easiest giveaway that you're not drinking enough water. Is all we have to do is look at your mouth, and we can tell you that you're not drinking enough water. Uh, suckling turns out to trigger or be one of those sensations. So this is for uh, milk letdown. This is actually be associated with a hormone called prolactin, labor contractions. We already met you. So here's how it works. 
action potentials are going to go to the posterior, or gonna, they're going to move from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. They literally travel straight on down. And the reason for that is the posterior pituitary is the hypothalamus. It's just an extension of it. So here's your hypothalamus up here. It has just this weird little section that comes off to the, to the bottom. And that's this port part here, is the posterior pituitary. Depending on what class you take and how smart your professor wishes to sound, they might not say posterior pituitary. They might reference the neurohypothesis. And you're going to say, did you mean to say hypothesis? And they're going to say, no, you idiot. It's hypothesis. You're like, I, I think you're, you didn't spell the word right. The hypothesis is the pituitary. That's the old word for the pituitary, is the hypothesis. So the neurohypothesis is referencing the fact that it is brain tissue. It secretes two and only two hormones, it being the neurohypothesis, it being the posterior pituitary. One of them is going to be called ADH. ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. So hormone, got it. Anti, against, got it. Diuretic. Diuretic. The diuretic would be the adjective form of diuresis. That's not helping us. Diuresis. Can you think of any word in English that kind of sounds like that? Diuresis, or that you could pluck out of that word? Do you have any words that kind of sound like that, like, that they might be hidden in there? So diarrhea, so we have the start, but the end is a little different. So let's get rid of the die part. So we have uresis. So urethra, do you know what the urethra is with? With the kidneys, but keep going. And bladder, okay, keep going. Ureters, keep going. Urine. Diuresis is urination. This is your don't urinate hormone. The job of this hormone is to prevent you from urinating. So when does it kick in? Now, because it's been hot and windy for a couple of days which is why we all have cracked lips, because the hormone is working. It's trying to save water in your body by stealing it from spots like your lips. Its target turns out to be your kidneys, because your kidneys are where you're going to lose your water. So it's going to try and save water from your kidneys. So it's going to be a water saver. Oxytocin, we've already met at least 
with its job with uterus contractions. Oxytocin also has been known as the love hormone. It's the hormone that is associated with connections. The way you get it is through contact. Have any of you ever heard that, oh yes, you need to have like seven hugs a day to be happy or, or something like that? And you're like, oh, that sounds like an excuse that a guy came up with to like touch people on. This sounds a little creepy. Right? Does it not sound like that? The catch is, yes, the guys are still that gross. But it's also kind of sort of true. Because if we were to track your brain releasing oxytocin, what you see is physical contact, like hugging, causes it to get released. And it is best released when it's skin-to-skin -skin contact. It's why, if you have a newborn baby, they tell you it's very important to have skin-to-skin -skin contact. Because oxytocin, in its love hormone job, is establishing a bond between you two. And it is literally changing your body to say, oh, I love you. Which is also in part why... It's a love hormone. And it's why, as weird as it is, you do feel better if you get hugs throughout the day. It's this hormone that's doing that to you. This is the easy side. Let's go to the harder side. The other portion, the front side, is given the fancy name of the adeno hypothesis. Adeno or adno is more appropriate, but it just sounds weird. It's called the adeno hypothesis. Adeno means gland. So this side is a proper endocrine gland. Where does it come from? Great question, your mouth. Your mouth, when you're developing, a chunk of it in the very back rips away from the back of your mouth and it travels eh, like a couple of millimeters to where the neuro hypothesis is and it slams onto the front. It's why the picture has two chunks to it. We have the frontal, the front lobe, then we have the back portion that dangles down. This part here is the real gland that came from your mouth. It just traveled from your mouth, which was about right here, to right there. It actually doesn't make a very long travel. The catch is, it needs to be told what to do. So who tells the adenohypophysis or the anterior pituitary that's at least convenient, adenohypophysis, anterior pituitary. Hey, the A matches with the A. Yay, at least for that. The way it gets told what to do is through a system that's referred to as a portal system. Portal systems are not very common. We are going to meet... Actually, I could talk about more of them, but I'm probably realistically only going to point out three of them to you the entire for the rest of the semester. There are more, but and usually they're in certain circumstances. In this particular case, a portal system is where we break the pattern of normal circulation. Normal circulation goes artery, capillary, vein, artery, capillary, vein, artery capillary vein. A portal system says, no, 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 no. I'm going to throw in an extra set of capillaries. So we're going to go artery, capillary, vein, capillary. And then there'll be another vein on the other side. So we're throwing in an extra set of capillaries or whatever those do. 
here's what it is. You're going to have a set of capillaries up in your brain, up in your hypothalamus. You're then going to have some portal veins that are going to go from the hypothalamus down to the anterior pituitary. Then in your anterior pituitary, you're going to have another set of capillaries. So we go capillaries, veins, more capillaries. Why do that? Because we're going to dump hormones into the blood supply up here. And the blood supply is going to carry the hormones from up here in the hypothalamus down to the anterior pituitary. So we're secreting neurohormones at the top that are going to go and influence this gland at the bottom. What these hormones are going to then do is tell the anterior pituitary to release hormones. These are the hormones that are secreted. So the releasing hormones are going to come from the hypothalamus. And their target is going to be the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is then going to secrete a whole bunch of other hormones. And their names actually turn out to be useful. So if I may give you a brief list of what they are. FSH and LH. Follicle stimulating hormone luteinizing hormone hormone follicle stimulating i'm going to make i'm going to make these things called follicles grow luteinizing i'm going to make whatever luteinizing is tsh thyroid stimulating hormone That's going to stimulate the thyroid. Got it. ACTH. Adrenocorticotropic hormone. It's going to target the adrenal cortex, and it's going to make it grow. Because tropic means nourish. So it's going to grow as a result. So which one does prolactin kill off? Too much prolactin tells the brain we've made enough ACTH so you can cut that out. And that's the hormone that we would see drop in someone who's taking lots of pregnisone. Prolactin is prolactin. So prolactin, so pro, good for before. Lactin, lactose. Milk. This is the only one where we don't know what it does in guys. Most things that when we talk about hormones or physiology, what we are actually talking about are guys. Almost everything in medicine, almost everything in basic human physiology, we're actually talking about guys. Here's one of the weirdos exceptions. Guys make it, do not know what it does. We have no clue its function in half of the humans. Females, we know what it does. Causes you to release milk. And it is so sensitive that crying babies can trigger its release. Which is why some mothers who just have a newborn, like they fear going onto airplanes. Because they might start leaking out all over the place if there's another child 
crying on the airplane. And they have no ability to stop it. Because this one just says, oh, crying baby, that means feeding time. And you're like, but not here. Uh, damn it. MSH. Melanocyte stimulating hormone. GH, growth hormone. 